Welcome to Physics 116. This is the second semester of the introductory algebra-based physics course at Ohio Wesleyan. And, well, we're going to jump back in. These are, again, the video summaries for the lectures that have taken place. Um, so for this first day of class, we jumped right back into things, looking at chapter 13, which is all about vibrations and waves. And the easiest way to look at things, first of all, vibrations and waves, is to look at a spring. And so it helps to actually remind ourselves what forces and energies are involved with a spring. So for a spring, the spring force is a Hooke's Law force, or a restoring force, that depends on the spring constant, basically meaning how flexible is the spring, how easily is it compressed or is it stretched. So this is that's measured in terms of newtons per meter. And then we have how much it's been stretched or compressed from its equilibrium position, that being x0. If we say the equilibrium position is at 0, then that's just x minus 0 or x. So it's how much the spring has been compressed or stretched, not how long is the spring in general. Okay. And I didn't put directions on here, but that's because I wanted to make the point that the magnitude of the spring force is equal to the magnitude of this amount of stretching or compressing times the spring constant. The direction depends on the um, orientation of your spring, but you know that it's going to be a restoring force, meaning that if you have an object and you have attached to a spring on top of a table, and you have pulled it out, then the actual force that it is experiencing, aside from your hand, is pointing in the other direction because the spring wants to go back to the way that it was. So if I have this spring here, and I pull it away, it's going to want to come back because the force is pulling it back in that direction. Now, it will bounce back the other way at a certain point because it ends up having a force directed in this direction, because of the compression aspect of the spring. Now, when I do pull this away, I'm not only exerting a force, I'm also storing energy in the springs that when I let it go, that energy will end up being converted into kinetic energy. And just to remind ourselves, the form for that, the potential energy for a spring, is equal to one-half times the spring constant, times, again, this amount it's been stretched or compressed squared. The potential energy is a scalar, the force is a vector. Okay, so in thinking about vibrations and waves, specifically in this case vibrations, with um, a spring, then we can set some behavior in motion, and we can analyze the behavior of this spring and this mass that is on the end of this spring. Okay? It is going up and down in the same repeated fashion, always going until, because of frictional effects with regard to the actual structure of the spring, until it eventually slows down. Okay? But in an idealized situation where there is no friction involved, then it will go up to a certain amount go down and go back up and go down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, at the same rate. Um, well, not at the same rate, in the same way. And we call that sort of situation where something is going back and forth over a cycle, um, we call that simple harmonic motion, when there is some kind of restoring force that is actually involved. So mathematically, we can describe anything that works in this way by looking at it from that aspect of simple harmonic motion. Okay, it, it has um, some maximum height above an equilibrium position, that being when it's all the way up here, and a maximum distance below an equilibrium position, and it hits all the different places in between. And of course, the reason why it goes in the different directions is because of the different forces that are at play here. So if we remember, Newton's second law is telling us that the sum of the forces is equal to 
mass times acceleration, if we are looking at this hanging block right here, and let's say it's um, on its way down, then we have the gravitational force that is going down, we have the spring force which is pointing up at that point, and we have, uh, let's, let's say it's gone past its equilibrium point. And then we have the overall acceleration that it's experiencing. So we would have plus Fs minus Fg is equal to its acceleration. And if it is slowing down at a certain point, then that means the acceleration is actually pointed up. So it would be plus Ma. On the other way, when it is going up towards the top and then it is slowing down to come back down again, then while the Fs and the, M and the Fg um, have the same well, potential magnitude depending on what situation you're talking about, the Fs will have a different sign since it will actually be changing since it will be a compression force at the top instead of um, pulling it back up. And so you'll have to change the signs. But the basic idea is that you have the interplay between the spring force and the gravitational force that ends up giving you this motion. Another thing to think about with this is thinking of a pendulum, where if you start it swinging, it goes up to a certain height and back down to zero and up to a certain height. And so therefore it's actually experiencing the same sort of motion where it reaches a mag and reaches a maximum and goes back down to reach the same exact maximum on the other side and goes through a place in the middle of equilibrium. Okay. So here we have, instead of a spring and gravity, we have the tension force that's in the string and gravity. You can work out the forces that are involved in that. Okay. But we can describe some certain things with regard to this sort of motion. Specifically, we have the amplitude which we'll call A, which is the maximum distance from equilibrium. And then we have the frequency, F, which is the number of, um, there are different ways to talk about the frequency, but there are the number of places that pass a certain point in a given time. And then there is the period, which we'll call capital T, which is the time it takes to go from one cycle to, uh, the time it takes to go through one cycle. So you go to some maximum, go to the minimum, and go back to that maximum again. Okay? So that would be one period. And it turns out that the frequency and the period have a reciprocal relationship. So they are related in that way. If we do have, like I mentioned in class, this an example of a horizontal block okay, on a frictionless surface. Let's say this is its equilibrium position at x equals zero, let's say, and we want to pull it out to a distance a from that position. So let's say that we put it to here where this is A. Once I pull it to there and then let it go, it's going to go back this same way to a distance of minus A from the center. So it will go through equilibrium back to minus A and then it will go back to equilibrium again and back to A. So it's going to go from A to minus A to A, and that will be one full period when it went from one, one part of the cycle all the way back to that same part in the cycle. Okay. And we can talk about the energy that's involved in this specific case. We can talk about it with regard to potential energy like we did in class two, but remembering that the non-conservative work is equal to the change of kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy in this case, we're just talking about the change of potential energy for a spring. 
And so you're going to have an interplay between those two things where when you pull it and it goes to the maximum distance over here, all the energy is going to be in potential energy in the spring. And that will go to a place where once that comes in this way, the object goes faster and faster and it has less spring potential energy but more kinetic energy until in the middle here where it's all kinetic. And then it ends up getting transferred again once it is starting to compress the spring to actually put some of that kinetic into the spring potential until finally it slows down to zero and uh, zero speed at that point and then the potential energy of the spring is at a maximum. Now as we talked about in class, just because the speed is zero does not mean that the acceleration is zero. In fact, the acceleration ends up being a maximum over here at the largest compression distance or the longest stretched distance. And you can think about why that must be the case for how the object is actually moving and the fact that at that point, it's got to come back the other way. And so it is able to actually make it have a velocity of zero, but then to come back the other way. Just like when you're tossing a ball up, even though this is not simple harmonic motion, when you're to tossing a ball up and it stops at the top of the arc, its velocity is zero, but it's still got acceleration equal to 9.8 meters per second squared down because it's still experiencing Earth's gravitational pull. Okay, So you can look at that, look at how those relationships um, work for the kinetic energy and the potential energy, and looking at how the forces end up causing the accelerations in this case. So in this situation where we have this block we know that the spring force is going to be equal to the mass and acceleration of the block. And so it ends up working out where the acceleration is equal to minus kx over m, where x, if we have x minus x is 0 here, or letting x0 equal 0 like I said in this case, we end up with a is equal to minus k times that distance divided by the mass, and that relates to those two things. And you can end up with a relationship between the velocity and the position of this, which I mentioned in class, but I'll write down right here too. If you look at that from the energy standpoint, you can end up deriving that V, the speed, is equal to the square root of K over M times A squared minus X squared. You pull it out, and it has a certain potential energy of one-half k times a squared. You let it go, and it ends up being converted into potential, well, into kinetic, and then and that original maximum potential is diluted um, because you're giving it to the kinetic. Until, of course, at the one place where x equals zero, that v is going to be a maximum because the kinetic energy is going to be a maximum. Okay, we'll be dealing with more of these ideas in the next class, as well as reminding ourselves all of the things we talked about in the last course so that you can take those like Newton's second law and the work energy theorem where if, of course if you don't have any friction then the energy before equals energy after those concepts that we talked about are going to come back um, in many instances in this semester.